Hello, this is a re-record of today's lecture. I forgot to hit the record button, so um, here we'll go for take two. So this slide here is looking at effusion. Effusion is the escape of a gas um, through something like a pinhole. So imagine a gas escaping a pinhole on something like a tire. Graham's law of effusion is describing the rate of escape of two different gases. So imagine R1, or excuse me, imagine one and two are two different gases. So these are just describing two different compounds. You can imagine the rate of escape of either, of either of the gases is just going to be directly related to their velocities. And then velocity is directly proportional to, you know, something like 2RT divided by molar mass. So at higher temperatures, gas will escape faster and gases with lower molar masses will escape faster. So we have an inverse relationship to molar mass. So the lighter the particle, the faster the escape. So let's imagine, say one is something like O2, or excuse me, let's imagine one is something light like H2 and two is something heavier like O2. That we can calculate the rate of escape of compound one compared to two so the rate of escape of compound one versus the rate of escape of compound two would just be the square of the molar mass of two, which would be compound two, which is O2. So that's 32.00 grams, divide by 2.016 grams. So this is equal to about 3.98. So what this means is that the rate of escape of hydrogen is about four times the rate of escape of that of oxygen. So if we have a tire or balloon or some sort of cell filled with H2 and O2, the H2 is going to escape faster. So our hydrogen will escape faster out of the cell due to its higher velocity, which is due to its lower molar mass. So we see a question like this, which gas would it fuse the fastest from a tire with a small pinhole leak. So we have, you know, maybe the thought of what the particle masses are. 32 for oxygen, 44 for CO2, and about 28 for N2. So the N2 particle here is the lightest. So it's going to escape the fastest from a pinhole leak. Now, I mentioned in class that tire shops will go out of their way to try to upsell you when you replace your tires with nitrogen fill. Um, they'll charge up to $15 sometimes, if not more, for a tire, which is really expensive because a gas cylinder of nitrogen that can be used to fill many tires costs nowhere near even $15, yet they're going to charge that for one tire. They tell you nitrogen escapes slower than oxygen. Well, nitrogen's lighter. It's actually going to escape faster from the tire than oxygen. So if you're going to fill your tires with nitrogen and pay, you know, 15 bucks per tire, that's not the reason I'd go with. Okay, so now diffusion is related to effusion in some ways, but just a different process. It's the process of a spread of a gas through a medium. And so we um, have neglected from the cell the presence of, you know, air or whatever the medium is because the particles are going to hit that medium every now and then. So they're going to be traveling, hitting different parts of the um, medium that the gas is occupying. So imagine this is air. So Every now and then, our particle diffusing will con make contact with an air particle, change its direction, kind of like billiard balls bouncing off. And so if you're looking at the, the pressure of our atmospheric pressure or air here, if you can make this pressure lower, I bet you can make this particle travel further before it encounters another particle. That's what mean free path is. How far does a particle travel on average before it strikes a particle in the medium? And so the longer the mean free path, would mean or be directly related to a higher rate of diffusion. And that these are going to be directly related to things like a lower surrounding pressure or medium pressure. So if you make the surrounding pressure low, then what you're doing is you're putting fewer particles in the container that the gas particle can strike giving it a longer and faster, longer mean free path, faster rate of diffusion. 
We could also increase the temperature, make the particle travel faster. We could also decrease the molar mass of the particle, make it travel um, also faster due to that lower molar mass. So these are the three primary controls we have over mean free path. So then we're discussing real versus ideal gases. So a real gas have finite volume and attractive forces. Let's look at the attractive force problem first. So if we're looking at PV is equal to NRT, if we're imagining the attractive force problem, the attractive force problem means particles are sticking together. And if particles stick together, then we have a problem with our number of moles. So we're miscalculating our number of moles. Our number of moles would be the free particle number of moles. And if some of those free particles are sticking together, then the number of moles that we truly have in reality are going to be lower than the number of moles we're calculating with the ideal gas law, assuming no attractive forces. So no attractive forces, all the moles are free particles. And if some of them are sticking together, the apparent or the real number of moles is lower than what we're predicting or plugging into the ideal gas law. So if we solve a pressure, then the pressure we calculate with the ideal gas law is going to be um, calculated with a larger number of moles than we should be plugging in. The real pressure here would be lower than our ideal gas law pressure. Now let's contrast that problem compared to the finite volume problem. The finite volume problem is the postulate from the uh, kinetic molecular theory of gases or just from what it means to be an ideal gas, that the particles of the gas, the gases occupy a negligible portion of their container. This is a pretty good approximation at low pressures, but once we get to relatively high pressures, this becomes a bigger problem because at high pressures, we're putting more and more gas into a container those particles are going to start to occupy a larger portion of that container volume. Let me mention the attractive force problem that we're mentioning down here. This is a low temperature problem. Low temperature because this is where we're going to get condensation. Condensation is the result of particles sticking together. So particles are going to stick together more predominantly at lower temperatures, and then we're going to have this finite volume problem predominantly at higher pressures. Why at higher pressures? Well, we're putting more and more particles of gas into a container, they're going to start to occupy a more reasonable part of that container. So the finite volume problem is a problem with the volume here. It's a matter of do I plug in my container volume or do I plug in my free space volume? This is what we should plug in here to calculate our real gas pressure or a better approximation for volume would be to use the volume of free space being approximated by uh, the space taken up by particles being subtracted off from our container volume. So our free space volume, volume of our container minus the volume occupied by matter. And this is going to give us a better approximation of our, our real gas volume, better approximation for our real uh, pressure. So if we compare our ideal gas law, NRT, so pressure equal to NRT divided by V. So our container volume is always going to be bigger. The real volume we should be plugging in is going to be smaller. If I plug in a smaller volume, I get a higher pressure. And so if I use the um, ideal gas law equation to calculate a pressure at relatively high pressures, that that pressure is going to be an under approximation. The real pressure should be even higher due to the finite volume problem. So this should make the, the real pressure we calculate greater than our ideal gas law pressure. So you can see we have opposite effects. We have one effect that's reducing our pressure due to attractive forces, and we have another effect that's increasing the real gas pressure due to the finite volume problem. Let's see how this plays out for a calculation using um, an equation we can develop to describe or better calculate pressures and relate volumes due to these two issues. Well, let's first show the slide. This slide here is relating um, the uh, sort of uh, number of moles that you would calculate off the ideal gas law and compare it to um, the actual pressure. And you can see that um, at the low pressure limit, we are under approximating here and at the high pressure problem, we're over approximating, kind of showing those two different trends. This maybe isn't the, the best graph to really understand anything other than the ideal gas law 
is being under predicting in one case and over predicting in another. Now this equation here is the one I was alluding to on the slide before, which is an equation that can better calculate and relate pressures and volumes, moles and temperature is one that corrects the finite volume problem. So this is our free space volume, which is the true volume we'd wanna plug into a calculation. This is our container volume minus N times B, where B is the volume occupied by a mole of a compound and units liters per mole. B is related to the particle size. Particles that are bigger, more massive, tend to have a bigger B value. Particles that have multiple atoms tend to have a bigger B value. So if you compare, uh, let's say neon's about 20, or uh, neon is about, yeah, uh, 20 grams per mole. Compare that to something like, um, something like argon. Argon's bigger, has a higher B value. Compare that B value of neon to something like, um, water, where water has a couple more atoms to spread itself out, becomes larger in volume, bigger particle size for water as it's spreading itself out. So our particle size related to B, one comparison I showed in class, I think was CH4 for CCL4. So they both have the same tetrahedral structure, but bigger chlorine, bigger space for CCL4. So the B value is bigger for CCL4. So B is uh, related to particle size, and then the bigger the particle size, the bigger the correction we're making for our volume here uh, with our Van der Waals equation. So the Van der Waals equation here is a better way to calculate and relate these variables together. It's gonna give us you know, a calculation of our Van der Waals pressure, and that this is going to be a better approximation of our real gas pressure than the ideal gas law pressure is. The A term is relating to strengths of intermolecular attraction because that's why molecules stick together. So A is directly proportional to the strengths of intermolecular attraction. We call these IMFs. And so a higher A means we have a stronger attractive force. And so water relatively high, neon relatively low, relatively similar molar masses, but the difference is water is polar, can form a stronger intermolecular force with itself compared to neon, which is nonpolar, doesn't have built-in charges like water does. We'll examine intermolecular forces in a lot greater detail in chapter 11, talk about them more there as well, but we can just relate in general. If you see a larger A value, generally it's gonna mean that molecule has stronger sets of intermolecular forces. And so what you can also notice is we're subtracting the space occupied by matter, but then we're also adding back in the pressure lost by intermolecular forces. So you're seeing the opposite effects where one's a minus and the other's a plus. The next slide we'll look at trying to calculate a pressure off of this equation. So calculate the pressure of nitrogen uh, with a container with 5.50 moles in a 0.6 liter container. So this is, you know, more than a mole, a lot more than a mole, and a lot lower of a volume of 22.4, the volume of a gas at STP. So we can expect this is going to be a pretty high pressure. So our ideal gas law, NRT divided by V, that's going to be 5.50 times 0 0.08206 times 298 divided by 0 0.6 liters. So this is 224 ATM. So let's compare that then to our Van der Waals equation. So I have my Van der Waals equation started, and then this is equal to nRT, and then I'm just going to try to solve for our Van der Waals pressure, so I'm going to divide both sides by V minus NV, and then I'm going to subtract N squared A divided by V squared. 
and then I can start plugging in some numbers here. So I'm going to plug in 5.50 moles times 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, 298 Kelvin. Divide that by our container volume minus the number of moles and then times the container volume, or I'm sorry, times the B value of um, N2. So we just look back on the previous chart to come up with that B value. You don't have to have these memorized, but so the B value for uh, N2 is 0 0.0391 units liter per mole. So our mole cancels. And so if I calculate this difference here, just to show and to think about right away, what is that free space volume? Well, it's 0.6 minus 5.5 times 0 0.0391, that's 0 0.385. So a lot of the percentage of this container, a big fraction of the container is being occupied by the matter inside the container. And then let me finish off the 5.50 squared times the A value for CO2, the A value, or excuse me, the A value for N2, the A value for N2 is 1.39. Inspect the units of the A value, notice that it's liter squared ATM per mole squared. So our mole squared units canceling here, and then divide by the volume squared. Now this is kind of interesting. We use a container volume here for V in both sides of our equation. So this is our container volume. This is also our container volume, and we square that so that our liter squared is canceling here, and we're being left with just ATM. So let's piece this equation together. So I go 5.5 times the gas constant, 0 0.08206 times 298, and then divide by 0 0.385. Let me hit equals. That's 349.3 for this term here. It's not negative. I don't know why I wrote that. So it's 349.3 ATM. Now my mole canceled, Kelvin cancels, liter cancels, and we're just left with ATM. So if I only correct the volume problem, if we fix free space volume, we now. Um, predict the pressure should be 350 ATM, which is far off from 224. So you can see the free space volume has a big correction, but then so too do the intermolecular force part of the problem. So if I take 5.50, and you can imagine putting this many gas particles that close together is going to make some of them stick together. So 5.5 squared times 1.39, divide by 0.6 squared, That's 116.8. So if I do this difference, 349.3 minus 116.8. Now, 116.8 is the pressure being lost due to the intermolecular forces, due to the particles sticking together. And so we do the math here, finishing this off. This comes out to be equal to 233 ATM. So we actually, in reality, weren't too far off with 224, but it's because we just happen to have some, you know, cancellation of the errors due to the volume being corrected and the intermolecular force problem being corrected. Now, one slight issue is N2 at this pressure may not really even behave like a gas anymore. We're going to see in Chapter 11 that we'll talk about supercritical fluids and at what point does N2 stop behaving like a gas and kind of be, become more like a liquid. This density is also pretty high, too. If you just think about the density here uh, for a minute, it's just the mass per unit volume, 5.5 moles of nitrogen, that's 28 uh, grams per mole. That's 154 grams of nitrogen divided by a 0.6 liter container. So that's like, you know, 257 grams per liter. Not this matters, but... 
in terms of the density here, this is approaching, you know, becoming what we might better describe as a liquid. So, oh, you know, once we continue to increase pressure, we do start to kind of mimic the liquid phase. So let's keep that in mind too, that we can't just ad nauseum increase pressure, but this pressure here quite high. Okay, so let's look at a couple of review problems. So this one here is looking at um, a decomposition of a reaction. So we have KClO3 being heated up where it decomposes to form KCl solid and O2 gas. The O2 gas is bubbled into a container that is originally filled with water that then the oxygen gas displaces the water and we start to collect our oxygen here. But then water also has a vapor pressure at this temperature, so we're also collecting water vapor. And then the total pressure we calculate ends up being equal to the atmospheric pressure um, because that's our total pressure due to the oxygen plus the water vapor. Um, so the partial uh, pressure of oxygen, 25.21 torr. So we're going to have this total pressure be the sum of the water vapor and the oxygen that we're creating from this reaction. Um, and so then this is 765 torr for the atmospheric pressure. And so it makes the partial pressure of the oxygen 765 minus 25.21. So that's 740 torr. And then now that we know the pressure of oxygen we're collecting, we know the volume of oxygen we're collecting, we know the temperature it's at, we can calculate the number of moles of O2 that are present in that quantity of gas. So PV is equal to nRT. So PV over RT would be 740 torr, 760 torr to 1 ATM. times volume, and then we'll divide by the gas constant. Times two ninety nine Kelvin. Kelvin cancels, liter cancels, ATM cancels. Only thing not canceling is the mole. And so this works out to be zero point zero zero. 992 moles of O2. So the next question would be, if this many moles of oxygen had to have been created by the decomposition of this reaction and then collected over the, this water in the speaker, the question would be, well, how many grams of KClO3 are there present? Or excuse me, how many grams of KClO3 had to have decomposed to give that quantity of oxygen? And so for every three moles of oxygen, we needed two moles of KClO3 to decompose. So I'm just using stoichiometry at this point, 0 0.00992 moles of O2. For every three moles of oxygen produced, means two moles of KCl3 had to have decomposed. And we're provided the molar mass in the problem. It's 122.6 grams per mole of KClO3. So our moles cancel, we're left with grams. If we work this out, 0 0.881 grams. So we can relate this problem to the airbag problem we solved before, where we had an airbag being filled from the decomposition of a reaction. The only difference is that airbag wasn't being filled over water, so we didn't have to subtract off the pressure total that we were collecting from the partial pressure of water. But we now learned about gas mixers that partial pressure is added together to the total pressure. So we can subtract off the partial pressure of water, get our pressure of oxygen, and from there calculate moles of O2 and then use stoichiometry like we previously did in that airbag problem. All right, we have a couple of review problems here now from chapter 10. These problems are in a uh, chapter, re uh, chapter 10 review packet on the lecture slide page. And so uh, we have a question here in using a manometer. So we're told here atmospheric pressure is 0.995 ATM. What is the pressure like in the enclosed end of the manometer here um, in units of ATM? The substance in the barometer is liquid mercury. And so if you recall, the idea with the manometer is you start with the heights equal, you start with the valve closed, you start with 
atmospheric pressure in the line leading to the mercury and the open end with the mercury as well. And so then we open the gas and one of two things happen. If the gas is less than atmospheric pressure, then the picture depicted uh, results where the mercury goes upward to counterbalance the pressure of the gas with the weight of the atmosphere. And then if the pressure of the gas were greater than atmospheric pressure, then we'll have the opposite happen. So we start with the height's equal. And then if you find the pressure of the gas pressing downward here is because the pressure of the gas is greater than atmospheric pressure. And the way we can calculate the pressure of the gas is to take atmospheric pressure for the, the case for the first case and then subtract the height differential. Um, the easiest thing to do would to be, you know, have both of these in units of like millimeters of mercury or centimeters of mercury or inches of mercury, but millimeters of mercury is most common. And then the other case, the pressure of our gas is our atmospheric pressure plus the height differential. Again, where they're both in millimeters of mercury or some length unit. So the height differential, this is our pH here, is 52 centimeters, 10 centimeters, excuse me, 10 millimeters in a centimeter. So this is 520 millimeters. So what this allows us to do is calculate the pressure of the gas for the manometer in the example by atmospheric pressure. So we wanna take this and convert it to millimeters of mercury. We just multiply by 760, that's 756, it's almost 760. So 756 is our atmospheric pressure and we we'll subtract 520 millimeters of mercury from that. We just have to make sure these are in the same unit of each other. And so that gives me, 253, I think. 236. Let's divide by 760 to go back to ATM. So that's 0 0.31 ATM. Two sig figs here, 0 0.31 ATM. So probably not necessarily an example you'll see too much, but I had gone over what a, bar, uh, what a manometer was and hadn't done an example. So when I did this example in class or talked about the manometer, I kind of wish I followed it up with an example of how it's used, but this is just an example of how it's used. Um, oftentimes I've seen, you might see some examples of this problem where the mercury, um, where uh, you see a couple pictures of a barometer, or excuse me, this is a manometer, I keep saying barometer. But you might, uh, a typical question is, often conceptual, where we might say a uh, manometer set up where a gas is greater than atmospheric pressure, and then which picture is the one that's correct, and it would be one that looks like this. Also, we often use, you might wonder, why do we use mercury in barometers and manometers? It's because you're counterbalancing the weight of the atmosphere with the mass of mercury in the column. And so if you wanted to come up with uh, a different liquid to use, the problem here is the density, or the issue is the density of mercury is about 13.6 grams per milliliter. So if that mass in this volume is being counterbalanced and we have 13.6 grams per milliliter, if I use water, I need 13.6 times as much water. Instead of having a column that's one or two meters in length, it's gonna have to be you know, uh, 13 to 26 meters high. That's gonna be quite a tall barometer. That'd be the height of like a big building. You know, so even if you used a barometer that's four or five grams per milliliter, which is about as good as you can come up with um, with other materials, then you just don't quite get there. So mercury is really useful for its use in barometers due to its high density, makes its column relatively small. If you could construct a material that has an even higher density, it would be even better because you could have an even smaller column. Okay, so let's look at densities here. Which gas below has the greatest density? Now, we have to really make sure we derive the equation or look at an equation looks like this. Pressure times molar mass divided by RT is density. I'm not sure if this is a provided equation or not on the exam. If it's not, we just have to go back and we don't remember it. We just have to go back to PV is equal to NRT. 
go back to mass over molar mass is moles. So we can relate pressure volume to M molar mass RT. So we have one, two, three, four, or five variables here. So we've done some problems where we give you four of the variables and you calculate the fifth, like give the pressure, volume, mass, and temperature, calculate more mass, et cetera. Uh, we can also rearrange for density. So if we multiply pressure times molar mass, that would be equal to MRT. Um, let's divide that by V. So divide both sides by volume, the, uh, divide both sides or multiply both sides by molar mass. And so then this is where our density comes from. Divide both sides by RT. That's your RT over here. And then this is equal to density. So density is equal to pressure molar mass times RT. And so that's where our equation is coming from. So from this equation here, you can see at higher temperatures, you actually get a lower density. Higher molar masses give you a higher density and then higher pressures gives you a higher density. And so if I have 5 atm of helium versus 5 atm of C3H8, if I'm taking an equal pressure but of a higher molar mass, it's going to give me a greater density. And so my helium is going to have a lower density at both of these two temperatures here. And so then I want to go to the lower temperature, actually, because the lower the temperature, the greater the density, the greater the temperature, you get this inverse relationship. So if I lower the temperature, I increase the density. So that's going to mean that the heavier particle C3H8 at the lower temperature has the greater density. Now, the thought would be that if, like, imagine you have a container of constant volume where you have 5 atm of propane in it at room temperature. This would mean like if you imagine heating the gas up, if you heat a gas up, you should increase the pressure. If you increase, you know, but the pressure has to stay constant. I have to leak some of the C3H8 out of the container to keep that pressure constant. So if I imagine increasing the temperature, I have to cut some of the moles out to keep the same pressure and cutting the moles out, you can see that that's gonna to serve to reduce the density. So D will have a lower density than B we could calculate the pressure at all four of these values and compare too. I mean, we can just plug into the equation, calculate all four densities and see that B should have and does have the highest density. There's a question a couple of slides from now that'll ask us to calculate a density in a problem like this. So we'll save the actual calculation of a density for that slide. Okay, this problem here is looking at air comprised by volume, 21% O2, 78% N2, 1% argon, water vapor, CO2 being low components of the atmosphere. And so if we remember that if these are presents by volume, well, volume is proportional to moles, so our mole fraction has to be the same. So our mole fractions would be 0.21 for O2. So the mole fraction of O2, the fraction of moles would be 0 0.21. We might remember partial pressure is mole fraction times the total pressure. And so that's going to be 0 0.21 for the mole fraction of O2 times the total pressure, 1.00 atm. That gives us a partial pressure of 0 0.21 atm at standard pressure. Okay, so again, our mole fractions or our volume uh, fraction percentages, because they're the same, uh, they're, they're proportional to each other. So their fractions have to be equal to each other. And so then um, a top Mount Everest, 253 millimeters of mercury. Um, what's the partial pressure of oxygen in ATM? So let's convert 253, let's divide that by 760. That's 0.333 ATM. That's our total pressure. I'm going to multiply this by 0 0.21. Air has the same component, the same percentages, but we end up with a lower partial pressure just because the total pressure is lower. So that times 0 0.21 is only 0 0.07. So the partial pressure of oxygen would be 0 0.07 
ATM, which is a lot lower than what it was at standard pressure. So go to elevation, probably want to take some air cylinders with you to keep that oxygen percentage close to what you're breathing in at surface, temp at surface pressure. So let's go back to density for a minute. Pressure molar mass divided by RT. So all we need to know here is that STP, now this is probably something worth remembering, zero degrees C is standard temperature, one ATM. These are the exact values. And so one ATM times CH4, molar mass, grams per mole, divide by the gas constant, then times the temperature, Kelvin cancels, mole cancels, ATM cancels, the thing's not canceling, grams per liter. And so we work this out. Point seven one six grams per liter. And finally, our last question here um, is relating back to the Van der Waals equation. So this is our free space correction. V is directly proportional to the molecular or particle size. Or the volume of those particles, so a bigger particle occupies more volume. A is related to the strengths of intermolecular forces. These are strengths of attraction. So two compound, like a molecule that has stronger attractive forces has a larger A value. So O2 for CO2 for the B value, CO2 is just bigger. So we're looking at O double bond O versus O double bond C to double bond O. Of course, CO2 is going to be bigger. So we expect this the, the B value for CO2 due to the extra atom. Similar geometry, just a carbon wedge between the double bond there, that this should be greater in size, should have a larger B value than O2. We'll take a look on the next slide to compare those B values. And then also, what about the A values for something nonpolar like CH4? For something polar, so what it means to be polar is we have these partial par, uh, positives pulling inward towards oxygen, giving it a partial negative, and then we're not counterbalanced with any hydrogens. Uh, we only have two hydrogens here, so we have a polar molecule. So meaning two molecules of water can have a stronger built-in attraction for themselves. So you have like a plus minus built-in attraction. So you can have two waters, you know, use these forces like um, electrostatic forces of attraction do in ionic compounds. But we don't get that with CH4 because we don't have any built-in charge. This is nonpolar, this is polar. So polar compounds are going to have a stronger set of attractive forces with each other. This is something we'll talk a lot about in chapter 11. So let's compare the A and B values for these molecules. So we're comparing O2 and CO2 first for their B values. So we're looking at the B value of CO2. It's bigger than the B value of O2 because CO2 is taking up more space. So that makes sense. And then I circled the wrong box. So this should be the box that I circled the CH4, not the CCL4. But what I wanna compare is the A value of water where it's polar versus the A value of CH4 where it's nonpolar. And so the A value of water due to it being polar, we get the polar versus nonpolar, where the nonpolar molecule has weaker intermolecular forces. Now, it's important when we're comparing polar versus nonpolar that we compare relatively close together molar masses. So, like water is 18 grams per mole, CH4 is 16. Look at CCL4 for a minute. CCL4 is just a lot bigger um, because of the four chlorines. It actually has a really high A value despite being nonpolar. We'd want to compare CCL4 against would be something of comparable molecular weight, but polar. So if we could take a polar molecule as big as CCL4, we're gonna probably find that it has a larger A value. Okay, so A value goes with strengths of intermolecular forces. And you're correcting your pressure due to those intermolecular forces and B is just related to size. 
Uh, one thing I pointed out in class today, helium versus neon is kind of weird in that neon has a lower B value, never really quite understood why that's the case, but helium is a smaller atom. Um, we'd expect it to take up less space, but for whatever re reason, it has a bigger B value. My suspicion is, is that this just has something to do with um, either an experimental error or, because um, I've never thought this is quite right, even though it's been this way for a while. Um, so I would just be curious on how these values are being determined. Um, so, uh, but that's the only one that stands out as being kind of a peculiar trend on the chart. But then if you go to the other noble gases, they do increase in values you would expect. Bigger particle takes up more space as a bigger B value. So this is the only one, helium and neon, where I think you don't get the trend you expect. But um, what you might expect for A versus B value on a test is just comparing magnitudes of two different compounds where the trend goes as you expect. Bigger particle, bigger B value, stronger intermolecular forces, more polar compounds of comparable size, bigger A value. All right, well, that's chapter 10. We'll pick up in chapter 11 when we return from Thanksgiving break. So enjoy your break, and uh, thanks for the attention.